delirium is an infection. Maker, why is it coming out of the walls? Are you sure you want to find out? To give the writers another chance of making sense of their own lore, yes, we want to know what Red Lyrium is and how it works. And then we find one of our companions. You're not dead. You're supposed to be dead. There was a burn on the ground and everything. And he's glowing with Soylent Red. Apparently it does that. It gives you a deep, booming voice. He doesn't seem possessed or mind-altered, just sort of bored. Did you hear that sound in between the dialogue? You're supposed to be dead. There was a burn on the ground and everything. Yeah, that was the sound of the jail cell mysteriously being unlocked, even though we have no jail keys, didn't force the lock, or use even magic, which means Iron Bull could have just walked out. And if it was locked, he probably could have broken the lock. Isn't it fascinating how doors just seemingly open whenever we're around? So Iron Bull becomes neatly equipped with all the gear which also came with us into the future, as if he was wearing that before. That time-traveling power of Alexis is so cool, it's able to steal the clothes off our people's backs and send them into the future with us. Has Andraste given us another chance? Mako, forgive me. I failed you. I failed everyone. The end must truly be upon us if the dead return to life. Uh, yeah, she's really... Uh, she's... She, she's nuts. Soylent red poisoning or something. Even though there's none in her cell. And there it was again. Make up Dialogue causes doors to open. It's magic, I tell you. Okay, how deep are these cells? Now it's torture chambers. I know it's a medieval castle, but this is turning into more of an iceberg of a dungeon than a cell block. Who knew they built castles downward? Almost every room looks the same. How did Trevelyan know of the sacrifice of the temple? Answer! That's a rather off-the-cuff remark from a conversation we're hearing indirectly, and unless there's some other family member of our own that could be recent, but if it is about us, that's certainly a very curious way of learning about the past that we've forgotten. Die first. Or you will. Okay, so Liliana has been hanging here for, I don't know, some point of time. She looks like a skeleton and is still wearing her normal outfit and still has enough strength to strangle a man through his armor with her thighs. Keys! Oh, that's how those lock things work. And Liliana is an angry badass and Dorian talks too much. Now, if Soylent Red is people, how and what is that thing? No! Okay, wait. What the hell was that? Was that boy Connor from Dragon Age Origins? Uh, what just happened? How could we have helped? Was, was he on fire? He certainly burned instantly. Those bastards! Which bastards? There's no one here. And how do we even know it's Connor? Did Connor know? Did, do we even know the guy? Did we even get a look at his face? Did the other Trevelyans know that Arl and his family? Like, what is going on? How can those bastards want a world like this? They want it to be just like the world of Old Tevinter. Comforting, isn't it? He resisted that demon to the last. Uh, okay, Dorian. How do you know this? What demon? I didn't see a demon. What are you talking about? What is going on here? Finally, we get some info from reading Alexis's journals. It seems Felix was attacked by Darkspawn, which might imply his early death being infected by the Darkspawn taint, similar to the Grey Wardens, and that the breach is what is helping the whole time-traveling thing work that he can't go back before the destruction of the Conclave. He is now in fear of what the Elder One might do to his son, since he's been protecting him all along. Protecting Felix has been Alexius's main plot. Maker's breath. Where did Alexius find this? How did he even move it here? Can we open it? Perhaps. But it looks quite strong. How desperate and paranoid must he be? His servants must have a way through. He has to eat. Let's look around. What in Andraste's name is that? Hold on to it. I 
want to look at it later. Ah, what does this remind me of? Oh yeah, when Mike Laidlaw was showing us this level back in the E3 gameplay demo. It was kind of clever how they managed to write dialogue and conversations that didn't involve directly stating things about time travel, so we didn't know what was going on in these scenes. They also changed the texture on Liliana's face to make her appear relatively normal or healthy. We're the ones who sent Liliana in here, she was tortured, and of course that will have a damaging impact on our relationship. Every major character that joins you in Inquisition has their own story waiting to be told, explored, and influenced by your actions. And there's the lying. Which all marketing is anyway, so you can't really fault Laidlaw for that. Now for one, we never asked Liliana to come to Redcliffe. There was no dialogue option to do so, nor any alternative nothing. This is a non-issue, and using Liliana as a template is incorrect. She's never used that way, nor is she even a companion character. Secondly, we thought she was bringing her spies, not that she'd come herself. And thirdly, this has no lasting impact on Eliana because this is the future we're trying to avoid. This video prompted many people to remind themselves if whenever such a quest were to happen in their playthroughs, never to order Liliana to go on such a quest. Of course, there is no option in the game. What in Andraste's name is that? Hold on to it. I want to look at it later. Who's present in your party affects the story just as much as it affects combat. Dorian trained under Alexius, the leader of the mages we're trying to stop. And having Dorian in our party and present for this encounter gives us options that we otherwise wouldn't have. Yes, it's true. Having Dorian in our party gives us gameplay options we normally wouldn't have because he's a necromancer specialist mage. But there's no option to remove him from our party or this encounter. This entire level and every scene requires Dorian to be part of our party. It was scripted only for him to be in it. Even though he never said it, Laidlaw was implying that you could take anyone in your party and they'd say and do different things in this encounter. Anyway, we find the main hall and the door we can't open. Through Alexis's notes, we discovered that we have to find a key broken into five parts, which are held by his minions. Let's look around. What in Andraste's name is that? Hold on to it. I want to look at it later. Apparently there's a large disconnect between what the audience knows, or what we've read, and what Dorian knows. Dorian, that is one of the five keys we need to find. You're darn right we're going to hold on to it, although I'm not sure why we need to look at it later. And of course, it's Soylent Red Shard. Yes, let's carry the poisonous, insanity-inducing object that might turn us into itself. I guess when we start hearing voices or growing rocks out of our hands, we'll just rub some other kind of phlebotanum on us. We can get that vent with the book if we sneak up on it. Yeah, yeah, totally. We can totally do that. The Venatory Spellbinder has a weakness to cold, making him a perfect target for one of our... <laughs> Seeing a natural choke point here, we can send Iron Bull to hold that position with his life, hopefully creating a cluster of foes as we send our range character... At any point, you can choose to re-engage time, begin the process of fighting, and then alter your orders, adapting. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I could really go for some light reading. I could really go for some gameplay that actually requires thinking, or does every Dragon Age game have to be on the highest difficulty setting? They haven't noticed us yet. Good opportunity to look for higher ground. Who needs higher ground when you have the awesome button? What the hell, Dorian? We've already started attacking. You've already started attacking. And then you start talking about surprising them? <laughs> One is interested in saving his followers. Let's head back to the main hall. I think I know how we'll open that door. Yeah, so glad you forcibly joined the party, Dorian. Real asset to the team. So we finally get to see Alexius again, and Liliana goes hide in the shadows, and then decides to hold Alexius' son ransom, or just wants to kill him. Now this scene is good and bad for a few reasons. It shows that no matter what we do, Liliana kills Felix, or whatever's left of him. This makes Liliana her own character with her own agenda. However, this also makes things bad because our choices have no impact. We have what the game designers might call a uh, a character with no agency. 
we may as well not say anything because Felix always dies and we always get into a fight with Alexius, as opposed to talking him out of his anger and despair, or even having some kind of paragon interrupt where we uh, judo chop Liliana from killing Felix, or whatever is left of him. As an aside, and I don't know if this is touched upon, but Grand Enchanter Fiona, who, as of now, has been imprisoned for a year, used to be a Grey Warden. In the events of the book Dragon Age of the Calling, which I have never read, Fiona receives a magical trinket that speeds up the calling process caused by the taint, that is, when wardens hear whispers and go to the deep roads to get killed. After freeing herself of the trinket, it appears the taint in her is gone. Now, if only Alexius asked a few questions or two about Fiona's past while she was his prisoner all this time, or befriended her, or simply asked for her help, he might have been able to save Felix and avoided this whole fiasco. He had an entire group of rebellious mages who do anything to survive, including join another country in servitude. You'd think they'd have a few bits of knowledge about unorthodox healing methods, as well as a circle mage techniques. Although you have to wonder why he didn't try everything anyway, since saving his son seems to be his main plot. It looks like he turned his son into a gimp or something. You'd think he'd have sought out the Great Wardens for help on the matter, potentially even seek out the Urn of Sacred Ashes, as well as trying to appease the Elder One. He's clearly the kind of guy who would do anything for his family. So what the hell, Bioware? What was stopping time-traveling mini Redcliffe usurper guy from interrogating his slave prisoner for a year? Or having a network of spies that could give him such information? Or talking to his magical slaves for a cure to his son's ailment? Considering his entire raison d'etre is to save his son, what was the point of incarcerating all these people anyway? To show off Redcliffe has layers of dungeons? To litter the place with Soylent Red? To appease his elder one, who could never be appeased, in hopes of curing his son? How about your plan B? What was that? Did you just stare at a fireplace for a year? So Alexius obviously loses it and attacks us. Victory is what now? Where do you Assassins? What are you talking? Oh, you mean a year ago when we took out your Venatori. Let the what? Oh, let's go back to the E3 demo. I'm clearly not hearing all these sound clips properly. Victory is impossible. The Elder One will destroy us all. Oh, well, that sucks. Luckily, I'm trying to go back in time. Wait, if, if victory is impossible and we're all going to lose, why don't you let me go back in time? Why don't you go back in time and correct your mistake? I don't understand why you haven't tried this yet. This is the main problem with time travel plots. If nothing seems to be stopping the time traveler from going back in time and fixing things, the story has to mention that and explain what the holdup is. If your current situation sucks so much and you can go back in time, then why aren't you doing so? Just so you guys know, victory is impossible. The Elder One will destroy us both. Just in case you didn't hear that one. You have no chance to survive, make your time, uh... Now I like that he's teleporting around the room, because he can break those cardinal rules of magic since he's time-space guy. May as well do that. Although, why he doesn't just teleport outside of the room, or teleport to a year ago and just kill me, I don't know. Maybe it's because he never actually figured out how to control time magic. That could be it, even though his attempts tell us he can go as far back in time as when the breach opened. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay, so he eventually falls. Uh, Dorian luckily finds the amulet on Alexia's person. Luckily. <laughs> he needs an hour to work. But that won't happen because now the other one has arrived, which sounds like a dragon. We never get to see him or it, which I would say is actually an effective method of building suspense. Everyone in this time is totally afraid of this character. Iron Bull falls like a ragdoll. Liliana won't shut up. And somehow she's able to do acrobatics and fight off a horde of demons with a bow rather well, despite being hung up by her wrists, on her, by her wrists for a year. And hey, look at that. We wind up exactly where and when we were when we were taken in the past. Well, what are the chances of that? That's not contrived at all. So, present-day Alexius just 
gives up. We don't talk to him about anything. I guess he accepts Felix is going to die now, and our troops just escort him away. It's like, whoa, aren't we going to talk to him about morals or ethics or any kind of conflict between antagonist and protagonist? Everything's resolved with violence? Or maybe, I don't know, say something practical like, you must now give us the authority of the mages, or you must now free them. Well, I guess he's defeated, so what's the difference, right? Kind of pathetic to have an antagonist that just gives up. Present-day Alexius is not future Alexius. This is an entirely different scenario. Okay, who the hell are these armored guys marching in, also with no weapons? And why am I reminded of Aragorn giving up Anduril at Medusaled? Never mind. Oh look, it's Queen Honora and King Alistair. Wait, it's Queen Honora and King Alistair? And here we shall observe the destructive force that is the deus ex, at least by Bioware's methods, that have an impact on the narrative. It completely destroys it. Everything we've done, as soon as we went to the future, was for nothing. We didn't even have to come here. The crown could have came and resolved this problem for us. The king would have stopped Alexius, kicked out the mages, and the mages would have gone west to Orlay, relatively where Haven is. And they check us out first because we wanted their help. With nowhere else to go, they'd probably hang out with us. Additionally, the entire future we just came from would not and could not have existed. In the course of events, our spies kill all of Alexis Venatori, Dorian and us get transported to the future, and then King Alistair shows up. So how the devil did Alexius maintain power? Clearly all of the king's men just waltzed into the throne room here without weapons, so they had no struggle along with our spies, our two companions, Felix being passive, and apparently Lelian is somewhere around here, he wouldn't have stood a chance. So how would Alexius stand against all these people and be able to create the future we just came from? It just does not follow. We could assume the Elder One was in charge, but there's no way Alexius would be here to do disgusting things to his son and grow soylent red rock gardens. The narrative has defeated itself. So the crown kicks out the mages, but we say, come with us, and guess what? The crown doesn't care. We took care of their problem. There's no issue if we're an Orlesian Inquisition, dear Miss Diplomat. You then have the choice of making them prisoners or allies, which are two very big extremes. How about slaves or servants or workers or soldiers or anything else in between? We would be honored to have you fight as allies at the Inquisition's side. Okay, so they're going to be allies that equate to soldiers. Nothing wrong with that, but I, I thought we needed them to help close the breach, not fight a war. Like, imagine we figure out how to close the breach, or small breaches, and then we'd have a whole bunch of Inquisitors like us running around, and we can send them on quests to close breaches. No? That's not what we're doing here. Okay. They're just manpower? So we're still the only ones who can close breaches, alright? Why did we get the mages, then? Although if we're like us, or if they were like us, there'd be less importance on us as a character or a functioning plot device, which may not be a bad thing. And then we could focus on our own plots, like our amnesia, or what our real motivation could be, making a transition from dude who closes breaches to dude who leads an army of breach-closing inquisitors. Kind of like an organization. The breach will be closed. You will not regret giving us this chance. Okay, that's that's nice to know. Uh, aren't you rather confident? Uh, how are you going to do this? Have you been researching the breach? I guess we can now focus on restoring order and finding those responsible while you do the breach closing business? It's not a matter for debate. There will be abominations among the mages and we must be prepared. Yeah, like we haven't been fighting abominations this entire time. If we rescind the offer of an alliance, it makes the Inquisition appear incompetent at best, tyrannical at worst. We're a despotic group of thugs who just gained more magic power. We have no idea what we're doing or have any idea or knowledge of how to accomplish our organization's three main goals. We are both incompetent and tyrannical already. The mages said they can close the breach. Let's see what they can do. What were you thinking, turning mages loose with no oversight? The veil is torn open. Ja, if I made them a prisoner, what kind of oversight would you require, Herr Kulin? This is all good for Cullen's character, and it really shows his attitude with his experience with the Mage Templar War, especially considering the events of Dragon Age 2. 
the voice of pragmatism speaks. And here I was, just starting to enjoy the circular arguments. Closing the breach is all that matters. And finding those responsible. And restoring order. Remember, three main goals you made yourself? No? Well, incompetent, tyrannical, and now forgetful. I got a taste of the consequences if we fail. Let's make sure we don't. We will not fail. We should look into the things you saw in this dark future. The assassination of Empress Selene. A demon army. Sounds like something a Tevinta cult might do. Orle falls, the Imperium rises. Chaos for everyone. Dorian is indeed a charming character. One battle at a time. It's going to take time to organize our troops and the mage recruits. Let's take this to the war room. Join us. None of this means anything without your mark, after all. Hey, thanks, Colin. You need me for my mark. Well, it's nice to know where I stand in all this. Oh, another wonderful piece of trivia you learn from reading The Calling, if you ever wanted to, that this is this dude's mom. Let that stew around in your brain for a bit before realizing just how shoddy and wasted these scenes are in these games. So, to recap, the time travel plot wasn't even needed, as it provided no new reveals about our plot to close the breach, and they could have just written Alexius so that he arrived there sooner while we were in Orlé. They have invisible walls blocking Redcliffe, so it should mean something less stupid. Soylent Red screws with lore. Bad, unselectable, irrelevant, and dramatically weak choices throughout, causing bad or simply skipped over options, whose actions seemed simpler, obvious, and better, as well as causing a lack of player agency. They use X Destruction Machine, and Freddie Mercury is a wizard.